Hey, welcome to the Fire Chat Podcast. I'm your host, Rich Rice, and today I have with me on the show, Mr. Lee Miller. How's it going, Lee? I'm awesome, Rich. Yourself? Good, good, good. So, you know, we like to talk about different things here throughout the show. You know, financial independence of real estate is what the show is really all about. Um, you know, but we bring in people from all different kinds of backgrounds, and we really just get like to get to know their story and what kind of brought you into real estate originally. So, um, let's start there. What, um, you know, like what's what's your journey been like, and and how did you have an interest in real estate? Well, that's a pretty good question. Um, I bought my first house um, at 26. I wanted to get the biggest house that I could possibly uh, afford, and I was single, so I turned it into a bachelor pad. <laughs> Started go. off with uh, four bedrooms, and because I lived near a couple college towns, it uh, turned into a seven-bedroom house, and I was renting it out by the bedroom and had two people in per room, and they were pretty much paying all my bills, so that gave me the bug for real estate real quickly that I can uh, rip, buy rental properties and have other people pay for all my costs for me. So that's kind of how I got started. That's perfect. That's perfect. You're, you're a smarter man than I am because I, I did the same thing in college, but I was stupid. I did... I, I just split all the bills evenly between all my roommates that used all my furniture, all my plates. It was my security deposit, my credit, my name on the lease. And I just was the nice guy and just split everything you know, all the utilities and everything that's right down the middle or a third or a fifth or whatever it was that how many people were in the house. I never even occurred to me to just like, dude, you're $500, you're $500, you're $500. <laughs> I don't know why, you know, I, I just, what, what gave you that idea? Did you tell me to tell you or did you just? I was single. I had nothing else going on. And, um, you know, I wanted to buy a place. Um, mm. So that was the opportunity. And, it's funny because one of my guys that was there, he comes in, he's like, hey, can I get some discounted rent? I'll cook the meals and I'll clean the house and I'll do all this stuff for a discount. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you're saying you want to basically be my maid, clean the entire house after nine guys and make my lunch for me just so you can get a discount off rent. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I'm getting ready to go to work and he'd hand me my little lunch bag and say, okay, here's your lunch. Have a good day at work. Nice. So well, good for you. Good and for then you. it's it's funny because later he went on to uh, buy a house of his own, and it burned down due to the fires. And he's trying to rebuild it by renting it out by the bedroom. And this was like a forty eight hundred square foot house that he was built renting it out by the bedroom. Mm. If he had finished that property, it would have been bringing in. $7,500 a month oh. in rental income by renting it out by the bedroom and the floor and stuff. He just, he's like, hey, it worked for you the last time. So now that I got my own house, I'm going to do it here as well. Very cool. Very cool. So you were, you've been house hacking for a long time. What, what, what do you do now? Uh, my primary business has been uh, selling solar. Okay. Um, I actually do home security and solar at the same time. And, um, I find that solar actually goes really well with real estate. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great way to finance deals and pay for rehabs. And mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm excited about merging solar and real estate into a package deal and offering it that way. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to, I know you, you do solar and security systems and stuff. We're going to come back to that in a second. Um, what, what are you, do you have like rental properties now or are you invested in any real estate at the moment? I um <clears throat> I started off uh, prior to 2006, um, had a bunch of properties, mm -hmm. over leveraged myself, and kind of racked up more foreclosures than most people end up buying houses in their lifetime. Wow. So I kind of took a break, lost everything, uh, lost my wife, lost all my rental properties. So oh, it took me a while to get back into the game. And yeah. um, just earlier this year, I figured, okay, the timing's right. It's time to replug back in and get started again. Gotcha. Gotcha, man. That's, that's tough, but I, I, I commend you for getting back in there. That, that takes Thank a lot. You. Um, so what's like, uh, damn, so you, you, I'm sure there's a lot you learned, um, yeah. you know, through that thing. What, what's, if we're okay talking about it, what's like the, the number one thing? I mean, obviously, you know, nobody that was successful didn't have failures. So like, what, what would I guess be like, what are you going to do different? Um, 
just because I know how to buy properties without cash or credit mm -hmm. doesn't mean I should unless I'm flipping them. Um, you know, my first deal, absolute grand slam home run. Um, it was a triplex down in San Diego, mm -hmm. illegally converted. She couldn't sell it through real estate agents. She had a $750,000 mortgage. It was worth $1.1 million. Wow. She said, give me $20,000, take over my payments. And it was cash flowing $1,500 a month. So absolute phenomenal deal. Yeah. $200,000 later, I lost it. But that was a lot of money to make for getting a foreclosure on my record. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so yeah. it was pretty cool. So you did a sub two before... You know, I mean, obviously people have been doing sub twos for a long time, but it's kind of a buzzword nowadays, you know, so you did that back in 2006. Okay. I bought that house in San Diego and actually I never would have lost it except I bought another million dollar house out in Downey and we were living in that. Mm -hmm. And as 2008 hit and um, the real estate world melted, I kind of borrowed the money from my sub two house. It was in my name, so I wasn't damaging someone else's credit. Mm. But I borrowed the money from the sub two house to continue living because I wasn't paying the bills. Mm -hmm. And by the time I went to course correct, the bank said, no, we're taking this property. You can't do a short sale. We won't accept anything. And they were just 100% adamant that they were taking the house. I mean, you know, it was a negam loan. So of, of course they wanted it. I'm tacking on 1500 to the back end of the loan every single month. So, so they called the loan due like uh, on the original, the original sellers. Loan, so or? the way it worked was the seller collected the money from the tenants, deposited it into my bank account, and then it left my bank account the exact same day to go to the mortgage. So okay. 12 months later, I go back and say, Hey, look, I've established that I've made payments for 12 months. Mm -hmm. Now let me refinance and put the mortgage in my own name. Mm. So when I did that, I was only affecting me. I wasn't affecting the seller. I wasn't affecting her credit. Mm -hmm. No one else lost besides me. And they said no on that refi? Well, they refinanced me, yes. Okay. But then later on in 2008, when that situation was happening, I was taking the rental income from my property in San mm -hmm. Diego to survive off of in my yeah. property in Downey. Okay. And then later when I tried to offer it to a short sale or investor or anyone else who wanted it, and the bank would not accept any offers. Okay. I had real estate investors that could have done a short sale. Bank said, no, we want this property. There's nothing you can do to stop us from wow. taking this property. I wow. said, okay. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a crazy story. I mean, I'm, and I'm not trying to pour salt in the wound here. I'm just generally curious, like when... Was that part of the deal with the with the seller? Was that you had to refi yeah. in that year? Okay, yeah. So she was only willing to let you Correct. take over her loan or her. And, and the thing is, when I bought that million dollar house, I had about a five hundred credit score. I had no job, and I had basically no verifiable income. Mm -hmm. I was doing a little bit of sales here and there, but um, she owed seven fifty. It was worth one point <clears throat> one point one. Went to a guy in my networking group and. Borrowed the money from the sec, you know, as a second mm -hmm. to pay her. I paid five thousand dollars to the wholesaler who brought me the deal. And um, th you want to talk about bad stuff? I wrote the contract myself. I sat down with her at the kitchen table off a contract that I wrote, and I basically handed her the thing and said, "Here, sign here, and here's your money." And then as I'm leaving, one of my friends said, "Hey, did you get the deed?" I'm like, um, no. So <laughs> I gave her twenty thousand mm -hmm. dollars as a good faith promise type of thing. Mm -hmm. And so the guy told me go back to get the deed. And so I got the deed and got that recorded. So at least I was protected. But mm -hmm. yeah, you want to talk about screwing up, man. When I handwrite the contract myself, don't have any professionals review it and kitchen table close. Yeah, that's a pretty good way to screw it up. Yeah, that was your first deal, you said yeah. that, right? I mean, yeah. geez, you know. Yeah, I, I, for a first deal, that's a hell of a first deal. And yeah. um, I don't think anybody would fault you for, for doing, I mean, sure, you know, we could sit back here and, and like you should have probably gone through escrow and, and, and title and, yeah. <laughs> and did all that above board. But, you know, in that situation, I mean, who knows if the next day she would have been like, yeah, never mind. Yeah. You know, and sometimes, 
sometimes you get a gun or have to get it done. You know, I, I would, I wouldn't recommend doing it that way, but you know, <laughs> Hey, like, uh, you know, there's sometimes you just got to get stuff done. You know, time kills all deals. So who knows what would have happened if you didn't do that right then and there, Yeah, you know? Um, but that's crazy. That's a crazy story. So, um, now, I mean, now that you were, you know, I just, what, almost 20 years ago. 2006. Um, yeah, it's pretty you know, close. Yeah. What, you know, because like nowadays, I mean, when you do like, you know, maybe maybe you could do some kind of option. If you were going to do that deal again, other than going through escrow, what do you think you would do differently to to protect yourself against, you know, changing, changing market, uh, you know? Well... Uh, not by Negam loan, which doesn't exist in today's world. Mm. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, just make sure that the deal has enough cash flow that it can cover stuff. And just because money comes in does not mean it's all my money. I've mm. got to put money aside for repairs, for things that go wrong, um, shortages and ten- you know lack of tenants being there or whatever. And so that was my belief system was all the money that came in was 100% mine. Mm-hmm. And I did not put money aside for future events. And obviously there will be lots of future events mm-hmm. in playing with real estate. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. One thing too that I, I, because I, basically it sounds like, you know, so you, you did this sub, this fantastic sub two deal, but then a year later you had to refi. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, what, what was the, what happened? She got it back or? Or the bank just like that was the just the for, close, but. for handshake agreement was that okay. I would give it twelve months and I would put the loan in my own name. And what was the deal? What's her? And you were making her mortgage payment. Yeah. And how much time was left on her loan? A long time. Okay. So, um, and this is just for people out there too. And my own thoughts also. Uh, I probably if I was going to do something like that again, or like if I try and do sub two deals, I always have in there. Um, an option, like an option to extend, you know, like, let's say if I did a deal where I, okay, like five years, um, you know, cause they have a call option normally. Mm-hmm. And, but that option is as another option of mine kicked in or baked in that gives me an extension or some way to extend that. So like if that year comes due, um, you know, I pay her the other 10 grand you right. know, or whatever, 5,000 or 20,000, whatever it is, you know, to keep that, uh, keep that agreement in place so that if, no, that things do change. Absolutely, you have some breathing wisdom. room. You yeah. Know, so, um, and and I don't know if it would have saved the deal at that point, but um, you know that's that's uh, that's something I just learned to well, keep. Well, and, and you know that was <laughs> that was back in the days of if you can fog a mirror, you can get a loan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was the attitude yeah. at that time, mm-hmm. and so you know, yeah, I got the loan in my name. Uh, I don't know how on earth any lender would stupid enough to give me a million dollar loan, but whatever they did. <laughs> I would have given you a million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I mean, because I had that track record of mm-hmm. the 12 months of payments from the tenants mm-hmm. in my account. And so I guess they just went off of 12 months of bank statements and said, okay, based mm-hmm. on this and our negam qualifications, you can fog a mirror, we'll give you the loan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure, you know, did you ever see... Uh, the big short. I have not. No. no. Um, great movie, but there's a scene where they go down to, to, to uh, Florida and you know, they're at a, they're at a strip club and the, and he's talking to the dancer about the property she's been buying. And he thinks he's talking to her only about like one property. And she's like, I have five houses Oh wow! and a condo <laughs> and they're all adjustable rate mortgages, you know? And he's yeah. just like, I think that's the point where Steve Carell's like, you know, there's a bubble. You know, in the in the in the movie, anyways. But um, so yeah. So all right. Well, how many how many like how many properties did you did you have or doors or at one time thirteen, I think thirteen doors or thirteen holds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and units are just kind of a mix. No, of thirteen properties. Never units. All all individual. Okay. Wow. Wow. Uh, so and it sounds like you probably had them cross collateralized and. And you're borrowing from other yeah. ones, and yeah. So, so I mean, this this, you know, again, I'm not trying to pour salt in the room or in the wound. It's just more. Of I was a, brand new. You know, <laughs> I just, would not repeat that stuff. <laughs> yeah. So I'm assuming now that you would, you know, like you said, you said something very important, uh, you know, about uh, putting money aside for you know things like taxes and maintenance and rainy days and you know market that shifts and, and 
just because the bank is willing to loan, do a cash out refi of 80% doesn't mean you should take it and go spend on all these other things. One of the refis I did do was to rehab a property that, um, and here, here's a good example. When I was living at the house, everything was great. Mm. But when I left the house to go get married, I put in a property manager who was going to manage the rooms for me and did not screen her, didn't do my due diligence, and she ended up being a con artist. Mm. Uh, after the fact, I found out she had been evicted like eight times. And so she's my property manager. And let's just say the whole house went to crap. And so... Once I finally went through that big eviction process, uh, when, when I pulled cash out to refinance, that was to clean up that house and put it back to rentable condition because it just all went downhill once I moved out. Wow. Wow. That's that's rough. I haven't, I haven't had that. Uh, I've, I've had an experience with a poor property manager, but not to that, not to that extreme. Um, yeah, that would, that would, and, and back, you know, back then it's probably wasn't, the systems, I mean, even, you know, like the, the eviction screening and kind of that, like that you can do now, you know, even that's not, that's not a hundred percent, you know, it's right. not like it's a credit score. It's just, it's, you have to, if somebody reported it, you know, then they'll pop up. But I'm sure back then there really wasn't a whole, you know, there wasn't Facebook. Well, no. I mean, there was maybe like infancy, but you know, so um, a lot of tough lessons there, man, but I, I really commend you for still wanting to go through it again and, and well, use all that, you, you know, knowledge because you have a ton of, I mean, if you had 13 properties at one time and, you know, and managed them and, and did all that, like you got a ton of knowledge on, you know, like real hard knock knowledge of, of what to do. Well, you know, you know, a lot of people suffer from paralysis from analysis. Mm -hmm. They go to courses and study and study and go to more courses and more seminars and never take action. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, you know what? I'm taking action. I'll figure it out as I go. Yeah. And so, you know, too many people I knew would spend twenty, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars on their education, but they never pulled the trigger because they were so afraid. I don't know it all. I, dude, most of us, even that have spent money on education, still screw it up. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, so I just I took a little bit of education. I said, let's go, and I'll course correct, course correct, course correct the entire time. Mm -hmm. And on that particular deal. Yeah, eventually it ended up in a foreclosure, but from the time I bought it to the time I lost it was two hundred thousand yeah. dollars. How many other people can say they made a two hundred thousand dollar, totally messed up mistake and walk away from it? Yeah, you know, yeah. so it's it's pretty cool. Yeah, I wouldn't say that's a. I mean, I wouldn't say that's a mistake. I mean, you probably made some mistakes, like you said, but you know, hey, at least you you you, you failed upwards, like yeah. as far as far as like you know, like you said. So that's that's. You know, that's pretty cool. Um, so what are you doing? Let's fast forward. You know, you took a break for for a few years. Um, what are you like? What's what's the plan? What's the game plan now? Well, <clears throat> I've been uh, going door to door for decades. Mm -hmm. Very few people can say they've got more experience going door to door than me. And so I start off offering one product and then someone else came and said, well, how about this product? And then someone else came and said, well, how about this product? Mm -hmm. And I just started layering multiple things together into a package deal. And I'll tell you, the, the light bulb went off. I knocked on this door, asked if you wanted an alarm system. He said, no. I'm like, well, do you want, what if I give you 12 months free? He's like, how? Get the alarm plus the solar. And I'm mm -hmm. like, do you want 24 months free? He said, how? Get the alarm plus the solar and the water. He's like, you're telling me you're going to give me a free alarm system plus 24 months monitoring. I'm like, yeah. So I sold the alarm. Buddy A sold the solar. Buddy B sold the water. We wrote him. A, I wrote him a check for his um, 24 months of monitoring that I'd promised him. And I got paid off of the solar and the water, even though I wasn't the expert. Hmm. I'm like, that's a pretty good trade. For the water guy, I texted him and said, hey, I got you a referral. He texted me back and said, I closed it. I'll pay you next week. And, cool. you know, no matter what you do for an income, if you can make four figures off of a warm introduction, mm -hmm. that's good money. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, and so I'm like, okay, as long as I'm going door to door anyways, I'm going to connect and partner and 
add on to everyone else that goes door to door. Put it all together in one package, layer the stuff together, and now I can offer value and savings that no single company could ever offer by themselves. And so I just, and I don't have to be the expert on all this stuff. Mm-hmm. I just know who the experts are. I pass the, the homeowner out to the different people for the services they're looking for. Each one of these different companies offer their service. And I offer a greater package deal to my customers mm-hmm. that is impossible to beat. Gotcha. So, so if I understand you correctly, so you, you started, you still like, so what's your focus? Is it solar? Originally, it was selling home security systems. Okay. And then I moved over to solar. Okay. And so now 95% of my income mm-hmm. comes from solar. But while I'm out there, I still do um, the other package stuff okay. that I was doing at that time. Okay. So, so when you, so, so you started doing, you started, you were recommending other people and then now you are that person. Correct. So that you just have like a, you know, like a multi-tiered thing that you can, like you're fully integrated. Like, you yeah, <laughs> well, you that's, know. that's cool. That's cool. So you can, so instead of referring other people, you are the other people now. Yeah. So yeah. my, I started a company, I called it the security broker, mm-hmm which is essentially because I was representing more than one alarm company at one time. Gotcha. But then, you know, and my tagline is protecting what's most important to you. Mm -hmm. Well, that can apply to everything, your finances, your house, your job, your income, whatever. Yeah. And so I'm like, you know what? As long as I'm a broker, I'm going to broker for all of the household services. And I'm either the expert myself or I work closely with someone who is the expert. Mm -hmm. And so no matter what a family's looking for, I've got their connection. Cool. Cool. So like instead of just being, you know, instead of just being like a, you know, farmer's agent, you're for insurance, you're you're just an insurance agent so that you can you know, represent, represent farmers or the, any of the other yeah. brands of yeah. insurance. So I'm not tied to for, one company. So you're like, you know, ADT and other, I don't even know who the other... I don't even, honestly don't even know what are the other ADT Brinks Protection One. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> I have seen those, but it's yeah. I would think of ADT all the time. You see them the most, right? Um, right on. So you do so, and then so you do solar security, and there was a third one. I feel like uh, water filtration. Water filtration. Okay, um, and you primarily do solar. That's okay. my focus. Yes. So I think we talked about this uh, a couple of days ago when we were, when we were in here. Um, I think your your opportunity is is ripe for you know no i don't want solar no i don't want no, and then there's got to be some people out there that say no i don't want any of that stuff because i'm selling the house soon oh yeah so and, and that's you know i everyone's like dude you you're doing so good why are you still going door to door because the opportunities when i'm going door to door are insane mm-hmm. there's a vacant house there's a uh, three foot tall weeds mm-hmm. um you know, this house has been city coded and, you know, and so as I'm going door to door for my business, mm. the number of off market houses that I see is through the roof. Incredible. Yeah. You have a, you have like you, you that's an incredible, that's incredible. Honestly, I, I don't know what you want to say. It's just, it's just an incredible, like if you already have a thriving business, cause I've been trying to get you know, for years I've been trying to get people like you that do that do door to door sales or Uber drivers or or whatever to go out and just do that. Like just, if you see a house for, you know, that three foot weeds and the abatement notice or whatever, like, just tell me about it. Just tell just take a picture of the house, send me the address. I'll handle from there and I'll pay you for it. Along those lines, I'm out door knocking, come across this house that was subpar for the neighborhood. And I'm like, Hey, have you ever thought about selling? He's like, yeah, it, it's mm-hmm. a possibility. So I come back to check out his house, and he wants to meet me at the front door, and that's where the meeting's going to be, is mm-hmm. at the front door. I'm like, um, I kind of need to see inside the house. <laughs> He's like, oh, uh, I wasn't expecting company. I was just hoping we could talk right here. I'm like, no, I need to come inside. One step in, I knew what the problem was. Mm-hmm. Massive, massive hoarder. We are talking... Yeah. 18-inch walkway through the entire house. Yeah, it's pretty Everything common. else was wall-to-wall, 
floor to ceiling. I believe it. Yep. And those bags, you throw the newspaper And like, in. even if he wasn't expecting company, like, yeah. what was he going to clean it up by tomorrow? You know, if you wanted to. <laughs> yeah. And so I go to make yeah. an offer and here's a really good learning opportunity. Mm-hmm. I made this offer and I mm-hmm. promised him a small moving truck and a team of people to help him move. That is a death sentence. You do not ever say a small moving truck to a hoarder. (laughs) (laughs) So I completely lost that deal because I brought up the small moving truck. Oh, wow. Wow. He just shut you down after that? He's like... Yeah, "Yeah." because he just could not comprehend. Why don't you get him a bigger one? (laughs) Yeah, we would have needed like five moving trucks. Yeah, well, what was he planning on doing with all that stuff? Hoarders just have that mindset. Yeah. The um, oh, well, you know, what's crazy is a lot of them. You know, every hoarder situation we've been in, I can't think of one that they actually packed up all their stuff and took it with them. Like it's it's usually, you know, there's there's a couple stacks, you know, worth of stuff that they really care about, and then they know like the rest of it's just gone, and they're not gonna, you know, I did. But, you know, I, I say that now I'm thinking back to one and it wasn't even a house that we were buying. It was my mom's. It was a, a listing of my mom's and um, and it was a friend of, you know, my stepdad's and like, list, you know, and and they had somebody that their their uh, that lived there, a family, another family member that lived there. And he and he literally wanted everything. I mean, he re- he rented like three storage, three f- 10 by 20 storage units Mm -hmm. and took everything like, you know, picked through every, it was, but it was a lot of motorcycle parts and, um, you know, I wouldn't say all of it was worth money, but some, most of it was, but like, that was the only time, the only time I've ever seen like a true hoarder that, that took everything, everything else was always just, you know, they like, they knew. (laughs) <laughs> I would have been happy if he left everything. Yeah. I could have easily got the dumpsters and hired the day labor mm-hmm. to dump everything. Mm-hmm. But I was trying to help him out, yeah. you know, that I would, you know, he's an older guy. So I'll bring in the back, I'll bring in the muscle mm-hmm. and we'll help pack you and move you to go to the place you want. But was that his main concern on, on just where his stuff was going to go? Yeah. I mean, um, just, you know, he had a place in mind. They wanted to go like a senior home or something like this. Mm-hmm. Um, but here's the thing. He was current on his mortgage. He um, wasn't in default on anything. He would not have shown up on anyone's list. Hmm. It would have been impossible. And no real estate agent on the planet would have accepted that deal. Yeah, true. So no real estate agent would have taken it. No investor would have found it because it didn't show up on any of the list. But by simply driving through the neighborhood, I'm like, I got to hmm. go talk to that guy. How long ago was this? More than a decade. Oh, okay. Did he ever sell it? Um, it was sold later on, but mm-hmm. most likely that was because he died, and so someone else gotcha. got it after he had uh, gotcha. moved out. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, I'm sure there's a ton of these that you see all the time, and you know, we 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 talk about it. You know, we we talked about it in the in the in the boot camp we did, the Firefast boot camp we did a few a few months ago. Um, you know, and I talk about it with like Deal Machine also. Uh, which I can put a link down in the description for it for you if you're interested. But I talk about Deal Machine for driving for dollars. Um, it's like an app that you drive around and you can take a picture, um, you know, of the property and then send them postcards. And to me, that seems aside from what you're doing. I mean, you're, what you're doing is basically Deal Machine on on crack. You know, driving for dollars like uh, even the bigger level of that because you're actually down walking the neighborhoods. You know, you're talking to people. Um, you're talking to people on, you know, if you're talking about solar or whatever, you have, you have like that in to just, well, what about that house on the corner? Like, you know, who lives there? Like, how come that's thing, you know, and, and that's just your, you know, your integration just even, you know, well, more just so. so last month I found another hoarder house and, um, just driving it. I mean, this guy had like seven cars and two trailers and all this type of stuff. So I go up to his house and I'm like, Hey, I'm with the homeowner's concierge service. We do alarms and solar, and Mm -hmm. we also buy houses. You know, just kind of threw that out as a nonchalant thing. He's like, oh, you buy houses. We started talking, working out some stuff. He goes into the backyard and shows me the coyote that he cut his head off, and there's the coyote body still sitting there. And I'm just (laughs) like, 
You know, and so he's like, here's the head, and there's the coyote body on the back of this car, and I'm just like... You're like, all right, this guy's a psycho, never mind. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) exactly. I'm like, what the freak? So yeah, I'm walking, and I see this coyote skull that he chopped off with a hatchet because it's coming after his cat. (laughs) I love my cat, but wow. I don't know if I can save it, but... So, okay, so what happened? Like... Still in progress. Okay. Still working on it. Um, he doesn't make much money. He ha- owns the house free and clear. But, mm-hmm. you know, so this time I was smarter and I wasn't going to say, let's take a small thing, you know. I'm like, <laughs> you know, take your time. In fact, you can rent out the, you can live in one of the places until the day you die, you yeah. know. But he just, he, that hoarder mentality, you know. I mean, he's making this much money per month. He has, no nothing. He barely has enough money to pay for his food, but yet he's not willing to sell. He's not willing to partner with me and let him stay at the house for mm-hmm. the rest of his life because, you know, in his mind, the house should be worth here, but he thinks it's worth here. Mm-hmm. You know, normal sellers will say, okay, the house is worth here. They'll try and get this. Mm-hmm. But this guy's trying to get double the price of his house. It's all original stuff that's never been fixed in, since 1969, and he thinks his house is worth double, so... Yeah. Well, what's his motive? Well, I mean, if the, if there is any, what is his motivation to sell? Travel the world. Okay. He used to do some stuff with sailboats, and uh, so he'd probably just live on a boat and hey, that's cruise what I the do. world uh, via sailboat. <laughs> that's what I want to do. So I like this guy already. I mean, man, minus the beheaded coyote. Yeah. Maybe yeah, you yeah. should offer him a taxidermist. And, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, but I mean, yeah, it sounds like, I mean, it sounds like you got, you got some room there. I mean, even if it was a, you know, uh, you know, we have P. Fortunato coming out, you know, this weekend, and a lot of what he's going to be teaching about. And you're coming, right? Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of what he's going to be teaching about is, um, uh, you know, how, like listening to the sellers and getting to know what they want, and that the 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 price really doesn't matter. Like it's it's the terms. So if if he really wants, let's say, five hundred thousand, and the house is only worth four hundred thousand. Um, you know, if he's willing to come to terms of, you know, maybe, maybe you buy it for a hundred now and you make him payments for the rest. Of and, the and I was and, offering a solution like that. Yeah. And in fact, I even found pictures of sailboats off the internet mm-hmm. and I made a portfolio of sailboats. Here you go. Which yeah. one do you like? You know, there you go. you're buying the boat. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's just, it'll be a long, slow process, yeah. but I'll just keep How following up 80. Yeah. I mean, that's a. Uh, that's rough at 80 years old to be on a sailboat. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, I mean, if you're a salty sailor and you've been doing it for your whole life. He, you know, he did maybe, have a background with it. Yeah. You know, that's well, I mean, yeah. So, so, I mean, it sounds like you're, there's tons of opportunity there. Um, you're walking by these houses all the time. Do you have a system in place of like categorizing them or contacting them? Or is it just like you kind of pick one or two and then you go after them or, um, yeah, I got an app on my phone, um, basically just jot form. Mm-hmm. And so um, whenever I'm out door knocking, I'm writing down if they're interested in the alarm or the solar, if I'm going to make an offer on their house. And then I go back and skip trace them and find out, you know, all the details. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, I do have a system where I'm following up with them on a monthly basis. And, you know, this business, it's all about follow-up. Absolutely. If you get a deal in one or two tries – happy birthday. Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to build a business, you're talking six to 10 to 14 Mm -hmm. touches, follow-ups, checking in. You can't do that on a one call close. So it's just, Hey, checking in, you ready to sell? You know, it's me again. Have you considered my offer? So yeah, Yeah. I am. I'm definitely building a monthly follow-up system uh, to call the leads once a month, put them to the next month, text them, email them, whatever it takes to keep checking good, in. Good, good. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad you have that system in place because, you know, we, we talk about the boot camps and stuff too. Like, you know, that follow-up is huge is, is, you know, our, even on our, on all of our marketing and stuff, it takes like 13 on average about like 12 or I think it's like 12 or 13, something around there of touches before it turns into it. Sometimes we get lucky, you know, we spend like three postcards and then we call us or one or, you know, but sometimes it takes 20, I think our, the most we've ever spent is like 27 and we were mailing a postcard for two or three years, you know, before we got a, a call, it takes, you know, it takes a, it takes a lot. And there's been leads that have fallen through the cracks. Um, 
you know, there was a there was a lead that um, somebody, one of the fire uh, the fire fast boot camp um, attendees, brought to me, um, and and I just it wasn't there. We were like ten fifteen thousand dollars off, um, and it was just it was just too high, and you know I actually saw that deal come across my desk. Um, a couple weeks ago and I meant to follow up with her and, and just like as a, Hey, you know, like we were, re- you were re- not, we, I mean, she was all her, you know, she was really close on that. Uh, she was only off by, you know, the wholesaler sent it out for like 200,000 or 220,000. And like, we were at like two Oh three, you know, when, when we were talking about the numbers and stuff. So she wasn't that far off, you know, and, and she probably just either, maybe she didn't fall. Maybe she did follow up and the guy just, you know, said no, but, um, yeah, I saw that come across my desk. Anyways, I don't go on about it forever, but um, that was the follow up's huge. Like yeah. it's it's just even if somebody says no, like you never know really how close you are to that deal. And yeah, you got to keep following up. You know? Well, <laughs> one of my um, one of my solar deals, um, it was like thirty two times that I followed up with this guy, and. Um, you know, texting, calling him this and that, knocking on his door. Mm-hmm. I knocked on his door four or five more times after because he was interested. We just couldn't put the numbers together. But, yeah, it was 32, 35 follow-ups over a span of a few months. And then once he signs up, then he refers his neighbor and he signs up. So mm-hmm. it was worth it. Yeah, and you can stay. And that's the other thing, too, we talk about is, like, you can stay in that in that neighborhood. And you could work that na- – I mean, you could work – you know, a couple square miles for, you know, and if you're, and, and that's, that's how I find my deals up in Crestline is that, um, you know, I'm very entrenched in the community now. So I get deals from friends and people tell me stuff and, you know, so yeah, if you're, if you're in, you did solar on one house, you did this on another house and you did that on another house, like, you know, you're, you're like entrenched now in the neighborhood. People trust you. They like probably waving to you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're pretty much like, you know, the only person that knows the neighborhood probably more than you is the mailman, you know? So and even then, you might you might uh, debate that. <laughs> it's funny because the mailman uh, for that hoarder house is a friend of mine, and I asked him, "I'm like, hey, do you know this house?" He's like, "Yeah, I want to buy that car he's got in his front yard." <laughs> That's funny. That's so, funny. Um, wow, wow. So you, you, yeah, you're, you're, you just have so much opportunity there. Um, uh, that's really cool. So, Thank you. Um, so what's your like you, you, um, you're doing a, you know, you're doing a ton of, ton of stuff with solar. Uh, I know you probably want to talk about that a little bit. So, um, you told me a really interesting, um, program that you have with, with these things and that you can get rehab funds or, or something like that. Why don't you, I, I'm going to butcher it. So I'll let you That's talk okay. about it. So the, um, solar lenders, um, they will give up to $150,000 unsecured loan to go solar. But that loan can apply for the roof, for upgrading the main panel, for other things associated with solar. Mm -hmm. Well, the company I work with, they've structured the loan program in such a way that we could offer 12 months same as cash. And so if someone needs a, you know, needs a roof or they need upgrades, Mm -hmm. I can, for a flipper, I can get them the new roof, put solar on, upgrade the main panel and basically as long as they flip that loan or refinance or whatever in 12 months the money costs them zero where else on the planet can you get money for free mm-hmm. there's no early payoff or no there's no prepayment mm-hmm. penalty and so if you're a flipper and i can incorporate the roof and the solar and other stuff into your loan i mean you literally you got a hundred and fifty thousand dollars for your flip for 12 months with no cost. I mean, it's just, it's it's insane. Yeah. And if you're going to actually keep the property long term, you could get a 30% tax credit from the federal government. And I'm assuming you got to pay the, out of the 150, you got to pay for the solar. Well, yeah. yeah. But here's the thing is in California, our costs are so expensive. I can get someone a brand new roof and put solar on for less money than they're paying to uh, any of the three major companies, SDG and E, uh, SCE or PG and E, a roof and solar for the same monthly price that they were paying for their electric bill. So if I just put a new roof on, is it going to be worth it? 
Of course. Yeah. Yeah. We warranty. What else would I? Yeah, because I mean, like if I just rehab the place and now I'm turning around and renting it, would that I personally still work? Or I personally would put solar on every one of my rental properties. Okay. Because solar is the exact opposite of an amortized mortgage. Amortized mortgage goes down as you pay it off. Mm -hmm. The cost of electricity continues to go up every mm -hmm. single year. And so I run proposals where someone's paying $200 a month now for their electric bill. But if they don't go solar in 20 years, they're paying $2,000 a month wow. for their electric bill. So if you're, the, if you're the landlord, if you're the owner of the property, you build the solar into your loan. And as you pay down or build the solar into your rent, mm -hmm. charge it as part of the tenants. As you pay down the solar loan, you're bringing up more of a spread. And so in that scenario, if fair market value is $2,000 a month for electricity, mm -hmm. because that's where SCE is charging in 20 years, and you own the solar system free and clear, that's $2,000 more a month coming into your pocket. Mm -hmm. Because solar produces free electricity. What you're paying for is the hardware to build your own electric plant on your roof. Yeah. So if you're going to have a long-term rental pay down have the tenants pay down the solar loan and you know the the SCE or the utility company continues to raise their rates you're just charging uh, the normal cost of the electricity as part of your mm -hmm. rent and you're picking up the spread yeah the more the it goes up I mean they go up like every single year yeah. last year they went up twice on gas and stuff too I yeah mean, you know gas prices I, I got I got annihilated, you know, on my rentals in the beginning of this year. Yeah. You know, when gas prices skyrocketed, I, I really would have, you know, uh, at that point, I wouldn't have mind uh, my water heater and, you know, appliances all being electric and <laughs> having solar. <laughs> I mean, and, and here's yeah. my testimony to solar. During the summer, my wife runs the AC 24-7. And she runs it at a temperature that freezes me. And I have to go put on sweats and <laughs> sweatshirt and stuff because I'm cold. I'm the opposite. But <laughs> I'm your wife for that. Scenario. We have not paid Edison in 15 months. Wow. She runs it 24-7. We never turn the air conditioning off. And we have never paid Edison because all we're doing is making our monthly loan payment. And she has free, like, you know. So as some of my families, one of the first families I helped, they were paying five, six hundred bucks a month, but they were pinching and scrimping on their AC to try and keep the bill down. Mm -hmm. So I doubled their electrical output for their house and still cut their bill in half. Yeah. So I think, you know, for me personally, if any law, buy and hold investor really understands it, I would put solar on every single one of my properties. Yeah. I was well, something that caught my eye too on your on your um Oh, but you emailed me the other day. Uh, they'll do a panel upgrade? Yeah. As, as, as part of it? Yeah. So the main panel, um, in order to do solar, we have to do a 200 amp uh, mm -hmm. panel. And so, yeah, part of your solar loan, the main panel upgrade, the roof, the solar, sometimes other home improvement stuff like HVAC or other things that are energy efficient can be included into the loan. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, so... It, we handle everything. You sign the paperwork. We deal with the main panel. We deal with the city. We deal with the permits. We deal with mm -hmm. all that stuff. If you keep, the, if it's a flip, you pay off the loan. Everything was paid off. You didn't make a single penny that you paid to the lender. Mm -hmm. If it's a buy and hold, then you keep it. But yeah, you don't have to pay for that main panel yourself. Mm -hmm. And you know, the you're making the tenants pay for your roof. The tenants are paying for. They're, and they're happy to do so because it saves them money versus buying from the electric company. Mm -hmm. Now, question. So on, on um, you know, for the buy and hold people, uh, how does that work with, because you're not, you're, you're not supposed to, you know, when, when, when you have, is that considered a utility when it's your own panels? Because with tenants or residents or, or whatever, like you're, you're not supposed to resell utilities. So like if I, if I, you know, if my utility bill is, you know, if my electric bill is $300 a month, I can't turn around and charge my tenants $500 a month. For That's that. because you're so. buying from the electric company. Mm -hmm. So you cannot mark up the electric company's price, mm -hmm. 
But in the case of solar, you're not buying from the electric company. That's what I was curious. So. You're building your own electric plant mm -hmm. on your roof. Yeah. And so the loan that you're paying for is to build your own electric plant on your roof. Mm -hmm. The solar system produces 100% free electricity. Okay. So you're only paying for the hardware to build your own electric plant on your roof. Gotcha. And then what's like, is it, is it in, in is the, is the loan an, an interest rate? Or is sure. it like, what, what is it typically? Well, <clears throat> that's the million dollar question. It follows the interest rates of the house. So the interest rates have gone up five to 10 times in the last year. Okay. Just like the interest rates of buying a house. Mm -hmm. But you know, I've got a hundred different loan options that I could offer. No money down uh, financing mm -hmm. for the loan. There's also the per, the PPA, which is a lease. For some situations, that might make sense. Mm -hmm. For real estate investors, I don't think it would make sense to go with the lease. Mm -hmm. But I've got all these different loan options. The secret, uh, the higher the interest rate, the lower the loan's going to cost. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to flip the property really quickly... You want to go at the highest interest rate. If you're going to keep the property long term and you're not going to be refinancing or whatever, mm -hmm. go with the lowest interest rate. The lowest interest rate will cost more money, but it's still a heck of a lot cheaper than paying yeah. the utility companies. So right now, like these these long term loans are sitting around what five seven percent. As of the date of this recording, mm -hmm. the lowest I can go is three nine nine. The highest I can go is eleven nine nine, and how long is that term? Uh, there's no prepayment penalty; mm -hmm. they can pay it off at any point in time. So we always tend to give people the longest loan term to keep the payments as low as possible. Okay. But if someone wanted a five year loan to pay off their solar system, yeah, we can do that five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty five. But for most of us, we'll put out the longest loan period of time in order to keep the payments as low as possible, and then just simply um, no prepayment penalty. You can get out from it within your first month if you needed to. So 25 years is the longest that it can go. So if you have, you know, let's say you have 25 years left on your mortgage and you want to put solar on now, you can get a loan <clears throat> as low as 3.99% for 25 years to help solar. And you said you could use some of those funds for your roof, mm -hmm. the electric upgrade, yep. some other energy efficient things. And it's not, is it, a, is it like a hero program or is it a... The hero program is tied to the equity of the house. Mm -hmm. And so the hero program is actually a lien against the house. Mm -hmm. Solar financing is an unsecured loan. Okay. So it is not tied to the house. Now they do put a lien on the panels but you can easily refinance or you can sell the house. They just take the lien off, you refinance, they put the lien back on. Okay. Um, what's, what's the longevity of the panels themselves? The product manufacturers offer a 25-year warranty. Okay. The company that I do the most business through, they add on top of the product manufacturer a 30-year bumper-to-bumper warranty. That includes roof penetration. That includes panels. That includes um, the inverters workmanship, everything, they warranty it for 30 years. Okay. And what happens if like in the middle of, you know, like let's say it's 25 years and, you know, 15 years in, you're like, ah, oh, crap, I got to replace the roof. What, do they come take that off? Do you got to pay the roofers to do that? Like how, how does that work? Yeah. So the first step of going solar is they um, inspect the roof first to see if it has the lifespan in it left mm -hmm. to make it 25 years. I know you had said earlier that some solar deals you've had have not had a clean roof put on. <laughs> yeah. yep. So yeah. the company I work with, uh, we do a mandatory inspection of the roof, and if the roof does not have 25 years left, mm -hmm. then we have to include the roof as part of the solar thing. Okay. The company will not allow us to put solar on roofs that have less than a 25-year lifespan. Interesting. Okay. That's a good thing. That's a good thing because I bought a flip years ago and it, it had solar put on two years ago. So I just made the assumption that they had, they couldn't have, they had to have put the solar on a decent roof or otherwise they wouldn't have done it. Right. You, you know? would think that I would think that, but I, what did I, what did I say in that presentation? That uh, you got screwed. <laughs> the roof. Uh, what, was the, what, was the, what was the takeaway for everybody? 
See if you were listening. You got You got. You can't assume anything. <laughs> assume nothing. You can't yep. assume, assume anything. Nothing. You got to go straight to. Exactly. You got it. What got are it. the terms? <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. So, um, so, and and you have options to reiterate. You have options for buy and hold people, and for the flippers, the flippers is you know they would take like the higher interest rate one. Um, that would probably be less upfront. Less all of the loans are no money up front. Okay. So all of the loans are 100% financing. The only difference between a flipper and a buy and hold for solar is the interest rate that I put them in. Mm -hmm. So if, it's an, if the interest rate for a buy and hold, I'll go for the lowest monthly payment. For the flipper, I go for the highest interest rate, and I can build the first 12 months of payments into the solar loan. Mm -hmm. And so... The, so basically, they fund everything. You don't pay for anything. You're not making monthly payments. The loan starts 60 days after the glass is on the roof. Hmm. So then if I can build into the loan the first 12 months worth of payments, as long as you've paid off that loan within the 12 months, you literally borrowed all of that money and it didn't cost you a penny in interest. Wow. wow. Okay. And what is like, like I mean, why, why would... I, the part I don't understand, to be honest, is is why. Like if if the if, okay, maybe I do understand it, but the like if the, if you're gonna borrow one hundred fifty thousand dollars, let's say, and it costs one hundred and thirty thousand dollars to to put the roof on and put the solar on, you can use the extra twenty for whatever you want, or like is there really that much left over, or. It's based on, it's got to be an energy efficient upgrade. It's got to be, uh, you know, so the lenders do give us criteria as far as what that money can be used for. But the roof, the main panel, the solar, um, perhaps an HVAC, uh, maybe new windows, you can build that into the loan. And, I mean, there's limitations you can't do. 10% solar and 90% other home improvements. Yeah. So there are guidelines as far as how much you can contribute above the cost of the solar. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you're buying an older house, most likely you're going to be replacing the main panel anyways. Mm -hmm. Most likely you're probably going to need to replace the roof. Mm -hmm. um, so we could put a smaller system on, replace the main panel, replace the roof. And if you're a flipper, you don't pay any money for it. If you're a buy and hold investor, your tenants are paying all those costs. Yeah, you know, and yeah. I can, I had uh, I had one fam, uh, one landlord that has was meeting with me. Ancient roofs, we were able to replace the roofs, go solar, no cost to the landlord whatsoever. The tenants were paying for it, and they were happy to buy his new roof because it saved them forty bucks a month versus what they're paying to the electric company. Okay. Okay. And if if they do, <clears throat> is it transferable? Like absolutely, they, yeah. Okay, so it does. If the, if you do all that, and then there's a loan ten years later, you sell the house. It could transfer so there's to the new there's owners. two options when it comes to selling the house. One, the new homeowner can take over the monthly payments wherever you left off at. Mm -hmm. Number two, you can pay off the loan when you sell the house. For me, I mean, so if you pay off the loan, you can sell the house for more money. Solar can typically raise the value of your house four to six percent, um, according to uh, national real estate standards. But that's if the house is paid off, mm -hmm. or if the solar loan is paid off. So when someone's going to sell, they either pay off the balance with the proceeds of their sale, or they transfer the monthly payments. Well, if Edison keeps raising their rates every single year, mm -hmm. and you're offering someone payments here versus what's here. They're not going to have the new ho new buyers not going to have a problem taking over your monthly payments. No, it's half of what they would be paying if they're paying Edison. Yeah, well, the only the only the only reason or the only hiccup there, I guess, is, um, you know, if you if because lending standards have gotten pretty tight. So, you know, if you have buyers and let's say they're in a you're in a you know uh, the buyer's market and you're trying to. Um, you know, you're, you're trying to sell your house and it's only worth, you know, 500,000, let's say. And, and then most of your buyers are only qualifying, you know, for right at 500,000. The way we would do that is we would get the loan first for the house mm -hmm. 
And then after we've got the loan for the house, then we go back to the uh, lender for the solar and say, hey, we need to transfer because they don't need to qualify for the loan. They just signed the paperwork that they're taking over the loan. And but so the new lender wouldn't see that anywhere because that would because that would be, the no, potentially because, mess up somebody's DTI. No, because the lend, we the homeowner closes on the loan mm -hmm. for the house. And so they close and they're just simply taking over the monthly payments mm -hmm. on the loan from the previous homeowner. Mm -hmm. Once they've closed on the house and the debt to income ratio is cleared mm -hmm. up, then we just simply reach out to the lender and say, hey, the house has been sold. They fill out one form that transfers the solar loan from the old homeowner to the new homeowner. The solar loan does not care about debt to income ratio. That's not one of their qualifications. No, of course not. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. It was more the you know the new lender. Yeah, so the, the new lender, you're not taking on the debt. Mm -hmm. You're just simply making monthly payments mm -hmm. to the uh, old person's um, electric bill mm -hmm. until the loan closes. And then after the loan closes and we've deal, dealt with all the debt to income ratios, then we transfer the solar loan over to the new homeowner. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, that sounds like some pretty cool programs for some investors. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, you should probably become a sponsor. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> I've been talking with you about it. I know. I know. I need to get you there. <laughs> I need to get you the, the packet here, but um, really, I just hadn't had a chance to really sit down and, I mean, I know you'd kind of touched on it a little bit, but uh, really trying to understand more how it works. And I think that's, I mean, you know, there's definitely certain things to look into a little bit more, but uh, overall that seems, especially for the buy and hold people, you know, um, if it's a, if it's a fair program and, and, and can work in their favor, I think it's, Here, it's be pretty cool. Here's the thing, you know, they're already buying an electric bill mm -hmm. anyways. Mm -hmm. We're not asking them to pay for something they wouldn't have paid for without mm -hmm. it. We're just taking a better, giving them a better alternative for something that they were guaranteed to buy anyways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. How's it doing in the mountains? I have a lot of trees. That's why I'm, I'm curious. Like is the, I know it's not going to output it as much as, you know, the desert, but like it, does it, is it still worth it? Uh, we basically look at the house. Um, we will see the shade view of the house and what it's going to produce. Mm -hmm. And obviously different locations of the roof will produce better. Mm -hmm. And so if one of your roof sections is too overwhelmed with trees, then we'll put them on one of the other roof sections. And maybe it won't be as effective, but it will still produce enough to justify the numbers. Interesting. Yeah, we'll have to take a look because I have, I have a few that... I wouldn't mind a, a lower electric bill and, and they definitely are probably, they're not definitely, probably they, they definitely are due for panel upgrades. And the roofs I, are all good though. <laughs> and we could actually throw in the tree trimming as part of the loan oh, as well. Right. I need that too. So just, just trip, forget trimming, just take them out. Yeah. No, but <laughs> that, that, that costs. So uh, I got plenty more. Don't worry. <laughs> if you were looking to remove some of the trees, I could actually build the cost of removing well, the trees into the solar loan with the hundred percent financing. Yeah, especially on a cut because there's I got some big ones that are really close to the house and I'm just like, yeah, interesting. All right, well, all right, Lee. Well, uh, we're going to we're going to be about that time here. Um, if people wanted to talk to you more or about real estate, about door knocking, about solar, about uh, security systems, how is the best way to get a hold of you? Well, <clears throat> my company is called the Security Broker. Uh, my phone, my website, thesecuritybroker.com. And my phone number's on there. Um, it's also 909-206-1281. 909-206-1281. That's my phone number. Um, but yeah, we, we cover all that stuff. So however I can help you, I'd love to show you some options. Absolutely. Would you be interested in taking some, uh, some people door knocking with you? I'm always willing to take people door knocking 100% of the time. Yeah, I mean, new people, experienced people, people that want to get a different lead source. Uh, you know, door knocking is a, a big, big thing. You know, it's a it's, as he's talked about. You know, there's a lot of opportunity out there. You get to see stuff, boots on the ground. So, I will take anyone door knocking anytime, and I can go to your neighborhood. So it doesn't matter where you live. We'll go door knocking and show you a new way to prospect for real estate. Awesome, awesome. Well, Lee, it's been great having you on the show. Cool. I appreciate you. And that is the wrap-up for the Fire Chat Podcast. We'll see you again next week. Thanks, everybody.